uh, AI actually it's very new for us so let's let's actually it's fantastic this just shows everything where it should be it's basically important to uh, understand what he focuses on uh, uh, because we we need to be able to assist him in what he's doing so it's important for us to understand what's important for the procedure and what's important for uh, for him to increase his confidence in the procedure. Now, point of care ultrasound has been around for a while now, but artificial intelligence with point of care ultrasound is a new advancement that is very much in its infancy. I'm about an hour southeast of Paris in France, and Dr. Dalvo, who I'm going to spend the day with, is an anesthesiologist specializing in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia nerve blocks. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. And he's at the forefront of this ultrasound and artificial intelligence evolution. I have my scrubs on now, and Dr. Delvo should be in this operating room just here. Dr. Delvo, hey, ça va? Hello. Let's do a bit of a COVID handshake there. How are you, sir? How did you specifically get into the use of uh, point of care ultrasound? Uh, I'm, I've been practicing anesthesiology as a diplomed anesthesiologist for more than 15 years. We, we do a lot of peripheral regional, regional anesthesia. This is not local anesthesia. This allows the anesthesia of a whole area of the body, like for example a, a hand, a forearm, a wrist, a foot, an ankle. And we can do that by putting local anesthetic uh, beside the nerve that goes to that uh, specific region. We identify the nerves with ultrasound and we uh, inject local anesthetic. It's done up front. You have to inject very small amounts of local anesthetic to see where you are. And where, you see, where it's, where it's dilating here, it means that you are, uh, I'm in the right position. This is what I want. If we inject into a blood vessel, into a vein or into an artery, we should see it right away. We should, we, we should stop immediately, otherwise this could go, this would lead to conversions and even cardiac arrest. So this is very serious. And if we are too close, if we are inside the nerve, we could damage the nerve and sometimes in a permanent way. So this is critical also for the, for the safety. And actually, ultrasound helps us to evaluate very well the distance between the tip of the needle and the, the location of the nerve. It's artificial intelligence. Um, first, I'm looking for the artery, actually. The artery is here. This is the main landmark. And I'm looking for the bone landmark. This is the first rib. And this is the pleura, and you can see the other, the other part of the pleura here. First time someone approached you and said, hey, artificial intelligence, we've got this idea. We think it might be able to help your procedure of nerve blocking. Yeah. Tell me about that conversation. Well, that was very interesting, actually. My colleague and I were, were taught about it. And um, actually, I'm quite an enthusiastic about new technologies, so I'm eager to discover and it was very exciting. I already have heard about AI and it seems very appealing to me. So it was an opportunity to jump in the middle of it to learn, to learn really, really something of it. Artificial intelligence will be everywhere, so also in anesthesiology, because it's such, as far as I understand, it's more than powerful and extending everywhere. It's showing the, its, efficacy, its efficiency in almost any field. Good to meet you. Same here. Now, you're a data analyst. What is a data analyst and how did you get into that? Hmm. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Perioperative and Critical Care Ultrasound webinar. My name is Holly Thompson and I'm the leader for ultrasound for GE Healthcare. Before we begin this webinar, I would just like to remind our audience that this webinar is dedicated for clinicians and healthcare professionals. And therefore, if you are not 
a healthcare professional or a clinician, I would invite you to please leave this webinar now. But for now, I would like to formally introduce you to Associate Professor Cano, who is the Chief Division of in the Chief of the Division of Regional Anesthesia at the Department of Anesthesiology with the University of Philippine General Hospital. Professor Cano is the president for the Philippine Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, and I would like to invite her and welcome her to do the opening address. Thank you very much, Professor Cano. Good evening, everyone. It is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that I welcome each and every one of you to this gathering of anesthesiologists from Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines. And with us also is a panelist from Thailand. We also have the honor with the presence of Dr. Hotem Abumari, who is practicing in the United Kingdom. Anesthesiologists have always been at the forefront of adopting cutting edge technologies to enhance patient safety and outcomes. And point of care ultrasound stands as a testament to our commitment in improving the delivery of healthcare services to the highest standard. Focus has emerged as an invaluable tool in our armamentarium, providing a visual window into the anatomy and physiology of our patients. This webinar was primarily organized for collective learning and knowledge, sharing among anesthesiologists from the three ASEAN nations and other countries as well. And we would like to thank GE for organizing this focus webinar, the first of the three series. Throughout the course of this event, I encourage all of you to actively participate, ask questions, and foster an environment of open dialogue. Thank you, and I will now call on Dr. Ko Zeng Nin, who will introduce the speakers. Thanks, Prof. Kano. Okay, so for our first speaker, we have Dr. Melissa Morala Caranto. So Dr. Melissa Morala Caranto finished her Doctor of Medicine at Pamantasan and Rungsot, Manila. She has her anesthesia res residency training at Hospital Manila Medical Center and fellowship training in cardiovascular anesthesia in Philippine Heart Center. She obtained her master's degree in business administration health program in Ateneo de Manila University. She is currently the section head of adult cardiovascular anesthesia and the hospital blood transfusion community chair in the Philippine Heart Center, lead cardiovascular anesthesiologist at the National Children's Hospital and section head of cardiovascular anesthesia in Medical Center Manila. She is a member of the editorial board of Philippine Heart Center Journal and Philippine Journal of Anesthesiology. She is teaching at workshops for point of care ultrasound and hemodynamic access to trainees in anesthesiology and cardiovascular anesthesiology, being the immediate past president of the Philippine Society of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology and vice president of sonography for anesthesia and critical care, the POCUS special interest group under the Philippine Society of Anesthesiologists. Recently, she has been elected to the board of directors of the Philippine Society of Anesthesiologists. She's also the treasurer of Operation Heart Foundation Incorporated and National Children's Hospital and is actively working with different social civic organizations in capacity, in capacity building cardiovascular surgical missions of the Philippine Heart Center Regional Heart Centers. Dr. Melissa will be presenting on focus assessment on fluid responsiveness. Dr. Melissa, please. Hey, Michelle, can you flash my slides? All right. Good afternoon. I uh, good. I'm say, I mean, good evening. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk on focus assessment of fluid responsiveness. Next slide. I have no conflict of interest. All the clips are from my recent patients. Consent for academic presentation were obtained, and anonymity is preserved in compliance with the Philippine Data Privacy Law. Next slide. 
the purpose of point-of-care ultrasound to assess fluid responsiveness is to determine whether an increase in preload can still increase cardiac output in cases of circulatory shock. Now, we have to understand that circulatory shock does not equate with hypovolemia. In fact, it is well established that only about half of hemodynamically unstable patients are fluid responsive, and fluid responsiveness has been variably defined. The most common definition being an increase in stroke volume of 10 to 15 percent after 500 ml of crystalloid infusion over 10 to 15 minutes. In this illustration, the red line represents a trend in cardiac output in relation to preload as reflected by the right atrial pressure or the LV and diastolic pressure. Okay, so the blue line represents the trend of the venous return in relation to the preload. It is, uh, let us appreciate that the red line, the cardiac output is increased and decreased given the same preload if we increase or decrease inotropy. Conversely, let us appreciate the blue line, venous return, given a certain preload. If the blood volume is contracted, like in preeclampsia, there is a decreased venous return. If this patient undergoes sympathetic block, like during subarachnoid block, the preloading or the co-loading of fluids would fill the rapidly expanding blood volume and increase the venous return. It is by working on this sweet spot where the cardiac output and the venous return are equal will we have maximum benefit in fluid, respons uh, fluid responsiveness. Next slide. While, next slide. While it is our first instinct to load fluids in circulatory shock, Please appreciate here that circulatory shock does not equate with fluid responsiveness. Circulatory shock is a state of malperfusion and is defined as a life-threatening generalized form of acute circulatory failure associated with increased and or inadequate, sorry, inadequate oxygen utilization by the cells. It can be any one of the combination of these five states: hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, distributive, or neurogenic. With the nature of anesthesia being the very, very acute care management, let rather than seeing this as a diagnosis and drug or management of choice, I think we can best appreciate the whole picture of our patient and see where the patient is in. Uh, next slide. Next slide. This diagram. Let us focus on the, I uh, know, back, back one, back one slide, please. Okay, Michelle, back one slide. Uh, no, forward one slide, sorry. Okay, let us focus on the x-axis. This is the preload. How do we assess the position of the patient in this diagram pertaining to preload? Next slide. Next slide. Okay. The most reliable measurement of preload is LV and diastolic volume, which only can be obtained through ultrasound. And as a surrogate to ultrasound, we are used to utilizing the right atrial pressure or the CVP. We must understand that CVP is subject to RV function in order to accurately reflect pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure. PA diastolic pressure is subject to P, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance in order to accurately reflect pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. PCWP is subject to airway pressure to accurately reflect left atrial pressure. Left atrial pressure is subject to mitral valve function to accurately reflect LV and diastolic pressure. And LV and diastolic pressure is subject to LV compliance to accurately reflect LVEDV. Now, LVEDV is measured statically with point of care transthoracic ultrasound and dynamically with transesophageal ultrasound, which is one of the indications for rescue TEE, especially in managing the perioperative myocardial infarction. Next slide. It is important that we should decide to, to do volume expansion. We know when to stop. 
doctors are walking in this tight rope between volume expansion to preserve microcirculation and good oxygen delivery, and on the other hand, preventing fluid overload. One wrong step in this tight rope, the patient falls in both tissue hypoxia through hypovolemia or hypervolemia. So other than monitoring the static pressures, we have ultrasound measures for fluid responsiveness, and we can also utilize these dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness, where, which were derived through from the arterial waveform. Just to orient, we start from the baseline. Uh, please see this arterial waveform on the right lower side of the screen. We start from the baseline. And when the aortic bulb opens, the atrial waveform uh, goes up to reach the systolic peak. Once the aortic bulb closes, the dichrotic notch is produced by the elastic recoil and the pulse pressure is the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. The area under the curve reflects the stroke volume. The increase in variation of pulse pressure stroke volume is a greater... Uh, uh, and greater systolic pressure greater than 15% all reflects fluid responsiveness. The PLET variability index is the same measure that is derived from the platysmograph or the oxygen saturation monitoring. Next slide. Okay. Now, as we have said a while ago, preload is LVEDV. So logically, the most well-validated incidence of fluid status focus sonographic assessment of the heart, abdominal veins, and the lungs, the pump pipe leaks approach. is used to gain insight into systemic hemodynamics and guide fluid management decisions. This is the QR code to the source journal. Please feel free to scan and download. Next slide. This approach to lung ultrasound shall be more extensively discussed later. What I am just showing here is that in a normal lung scan, we will just appreciate one or two A lines, but here below the several lung rockets because of fluid overload. Okay, next slide. These are normal and congestive changes in hepatic vein, portal vein, and renal vein Doppler ultrasound which will also be discussed more extensively later. Next slide. I shall leave the lung and abdominal vessels to be discussed later and focus on practical clinical assessment of the heart using point-of-care ultrasound. Given the very limited window to assess the heart while the patient is undergoing surgery and alter anesthesia management in a very timely fashion, we have to target just four basic things. Uh, animation, press, okay, pericardial effusion, LV systolic, no, no, back slide, back one slide, okay, pericardial effusion, LV systolic fun dysfunction, their relative chamber size, and right atrial pressure. So the rest of the echocardiographic assessment of the heart can be done when the dust settles, so to speak, meaning when the patient is hemodynamically stable and most likely in a post-anesthesia care unit or intensive care unit where we leave it up to the cardiologist echocardiographer to do the full cardiac study and issue an official result. So next slide. Next slide. So which is the best view? Whichever is most accessible, given that we are still in undergoing surgery. There are three basic ultrasound points, the parasternal apex and the subcostal area. By manipulating the probe in these points, we obtain the long axis and short axis of the heart in the parasternal view, the apical four-chamber view, the subcostal four-chamber, and the ICBC view. I leave the suprasternal view to be discussed later during the carotid ultrasound. And this is the QR code to the source reference. Please feel free to scan and download. Next slide. Common findings is for... Uh, back one slide, please. Common findings in focus cardiac ultrasound is A, pericardial effusion, as seen in letter A with an asterisk, okay, surrounding the heart seen from a subcostal window. 
in uh, letter B, the D sign or the interventricular septal flattening seen from the parasternal short axis view. And this is the left ventricular, left ventricle forming a D shape. In letter C, pletoric IBC because of fluid congestion. Okay, uh, seen in the arrow, no? pointed in the arrow. And letter D, a small IBC because of hypovolemia. Okay, so uh, next slide. While the, the biplane, Simpson, or the DIS method is the more reliable in accurately measuring LBEDP or ejection fraction, in practice, I leave it to the cardiology echocardiographer 3 who is doing the full study once the patient is already stable. In an unstable patient needing anesthesia hemodynamic intervention in the operating room while the surgery is ongoing, we simply obtain the parasternal short axis view at the level of the papillary muscle and do the M mode or the ice peak view of the heart. It is like sticking the ice peak and observing how the walls are recorded through the ice peak in uh, through time. No? So this is one dimensional ultrasound. Okay. So by measuring the diameter during systole and diastole, we derive the ejection fraction. So next slide. Jalil et al. in 2018 published this scheme of incorporating all the measures of fluid responsiveness that can be utilized uh, through echocardiography, pulse pressure, systolic pressure, platysmograph variation, ETCO2 variation, and the use of non-invasive cardiac output monitoring. All of these are readily available in our operating room setups. And the interventions that they included in this algorithm is passive leg raise and mini fluid challenge. However, for us anesthesiologists, while we are still ongoing with the surgery, after due notification with the surgeon, we simply place the patient on Trendelenburg position. When the surgery is already ongoing, especially in the critical stages, as much as we want to, it will not benefit uh, for the patient to abort the surgery. There is such a thing as a point of no return, which we cannot ask the surgeon to stop anymore. We can just ask them to do it faster. So this is the QR code to the source journal. Please feel free to scan and download. Next slide. This is my 10-year-old patient who underwent surgical patch closure of the ventricular septal defect and aortic valve repair four months ago. During that time, patient's systolic function as assessed during intraoperative transesophageal echocardiogram improved only slightly from 34% to 40%. Now, the patient is presenting with a four-day history of progressive dyspnea. When I saw the patient in his room, he can only tolerate a sitting position. He is tachycardic, tachypnic with distended neck veins and Ralston auscultation. The cardiologist placed the patient on milrinone for RV support, and this is the chest X-ray. Please appreciate the increased cardiac window, uh, cardiac shadow. So on bedside echocardiogram, we will appreciate that this large fluid accumulation that gives an impression of a floating heart. So next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, this is a, is a large pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion is an important cause of hypotension in hemodynamic compromise, which can be quickly defined on focus. It appears as an anechoic black space between two pericardial layers. Although it is generally identifiable on all standard focus views, please see the standard markers on the right side of the beam. Each dot is one centimeter. So by eyeballing, in terms of severity, separation between the pericardial layers during diastole of 1 cm is considered mild, uh, 1 to 2 cm is considered moderate, and greater than 2 cm is a severe effusion. In this patient, it is around 3 cm. At this point in time, will fluid expansion improve tachycardia and LV function in this patient? So next slide. Next slide. Okay, please. Okay, sige. Uh, please see this Frank Starling curve. Yes, we do have a cardiomyopathic patient with a decreased cardiac output, and this cardiac output is further decreased by pericardial effusion impen 
impending venous return to the heart as evidenced by the RA and RV collapse during diastole. Fluid expansion at this time will not benefit the patient. Uh, you press animation, please. Animation, press. Okay. No, the, the one here. Animation. Okay. Maski. Oh, sige. Press next slide. Ganun lang. Yan. Okay. Sige. Now, uh, press next slide. Press the next. Yan. Okay. But after, uh, while the while uh, we are draining, uh, surgically draining the pericardial fluid, the impediment to the cardiac chamber filling will be removed. And we are obliged to load the heart accordingly. Otherwise, the patient will go into fatal arrhythmia. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Press. Press. Next slide. Okay. So this is a 52-year-old businessman who fell down on his motorcycle and was referred for emergency partial right hip replacement. He just underwent transfusion of two units of PAC RBC for a hemoglobin of 8.2. Upon history, the patient has been having an on and off episode of shortness of breath on exertion. While waiting for the IM cardiologist to see the patient, the surgeon decided to proceed. Upon induction of general endotracheal anesthesia, hypotension ensues. ECG was printed from the monitor showing a typical left anterior hemiblock with slightly prolonged QRS and left axis deviation. On the left of the is the patient's apical four-chamber view. On the right is the normal. So please press the left uh ano to, ec the left echo yeah. So uh you will see here that while the LV free wall is thickening the septum is not thickening much. So uh for poll question uh what will be your working diagnosis? Is it cardiac tamponade, hypovolemia due to blood loss, myocardial ischemia or pulmonary embolism from the bone? Please key in your answer using the Zoom polling. Okay. Do we have an initial result, Michelle? Do we have the results now of the poll? Okay. So, uh... It's quite uh, diverse, no? Uh, we have adequately divided the house. Huh? So next slide. We have discussed a while ago pericardial effusion impending venous return. Now we are dealing with LV dysfunction. So the correct answer is C, uh, myocardial infarction. No, in POCUS, we need not obtain all the views. Only those which will show significant finding warranting anest anesthesia intraoperative intervention. This patient has long been exhibiting symptoms of coronary artery disease. This is the right ventricle. Uh, do I have a pointer? Yeah, this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle and this is the septum. No? Okay. So please compare how the free wall uh, please press the ano uh, please compare how the free wall press the echo please the, the one on the top right yeah please compare the free wall is contracting and the septum is not contracting much okay so when we have induced uh, general anesthesia, we have decreased the preload because of the vasodilatory effects of our medication, hence the hypotension. Now, in patients with coronary artery disease, the basic hemodynamic goals are maintenance of perfusion pressure inside the diseased coronary arteries or preservation of the supply and control the demand by decreasing heart rate. So, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. At this point in time, uh, we have already referred to our cardiologists. Intraoperatively, there is a wide selection of medications that we can give to support the patient 
uh, with the objective of maintaining perfusion pressure and preventing tachycardia until we are able to finish surgery and hand over the patient to the intensivist. So next slide. Next slide. Now it is important to properly assess where the patient is in the frank starting curve. Will volume expansion increase the cardiac output of this patient? Will static measures help the anesthesiologist in this assessment? Probably not because remember that myocardial ischemia also increases cardiac chamber pressures because of the impediment to ejection and filling. Because we are dealing here with a patient with a closed chest and mechanically ventilated, we can definitely make use of dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness and of course, Focus cardiac ultrasound. We can assess if the patient is improving in stroke volume variation or other parameters if there's some improvement in contraction by eyeballing when we, for example, put the patient on Trendelenburg position, which is like a passive leg raise without disrupting much the surgery. Next slide. This is my one-year, eight-month-old patient with intestinal obstruction due to Hirschsprung's disease. The patient is also be being seen previously for ALL. Upon admission, the hematocrit was 0.21, to which they attributed the cardiomyopathy. This is the official result of the full study that the Pedia Cardio Service did on the patient. They signed it out as LV dysfunction. And this is a focus study which I did while the procedure is ongoing. My line of thinking then was the patient was placed on NPO. Patients with LV dysfunction is not immune to dehydration. But how can we really be sure that the chamber pressures will be persistently increased even in the presence of dehydration because of bicardial dysfunction? And if this patient is indeed dehydrated, we have to correct that. Especially that this is a small patient. Next slide. Ne okay, next slide. Okay. The Pedia Cardio Service decided to start inotropic support and transfuse PAC RBC, which corrected the anemia. Blood pressure is okay, although I am a bit concerned about the elevated heart rate. For the second poll question, who among us would A, transfuse RBC volume per volume, B, Decrease the butamine to 3 microgram per kilogram to decrease the heart rate. Or C, fast rate 10 ml per kilogram. Please enter your answer in the Zoom poll. So do we have a... Uh, ano, uh, an initial result, Michelle? Okay. Again, we have divided the house, but this time uh, a lot more is gearing towards either transfusing RBC volume per volume or decreasing the dobutamine. No? So next slide. Next slide. So at this point in time, I have decided to leave the inotropes as it is because we are still see LV dysfunction despite the correction of anemia. I did not see the logic in volume expansion because of cardiac the cardiac chamber as seen in this focus is quite huge. No, it's it's already full. Since the surgery is ongoing, option A, transfusion of PAC RBC volume for volume is the way to go. Some would ask if other components like the fresh frozen plasma and the platelets should be given. If there is any indication for giving it, we can give it. However, we must keep in mind that this heart with a filled up cardiac chamber and its walls contracting so weakly may not be able to pump the all the blood and blood components that will be bombarded to it. For my la last uh, case, next. Chamber. Next slide. Next. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Ah, uh, this is a three-year-old male with ventricular septal defect, patent foramen ovale, pulmonary stenosis, and imperforate anus. So we have an ongoing fluid at D five point three NaCl at two mL per kilogram per hour. 
Given that pending a full study of the pediatric cardiologist echocardiographer 3, we have to perform an emergency colostomy. So what I am seeing here is a dilated IVC, a pulmonary stenosis, and a hyperdynamic RVH. Uh, pushing against it. So for poll question number three, with blood pressure of 66 over 32, would cardiac output increase by volume expansion? So should we do option A, increase to 4 ml per kilo per hour, or option B, decrease to 1 ml per kilo per hour? Please uh, place your answer in the Zoom poll. So do we have an initial, uh, Michelle, initial uh, poll? Wow, it's really 50-50. <laughs> no? So the correct answer, next slide. The correct answer is option A. Uh, to increase the fluid rate to 4 ml per kilogram per hour to improve blood pressure. The IVC distension is not due to fluid overload. Uh, it is a back pressure from the increased RA pressure and increased RV pressure from the pulmonary stenosis. The RV here is even underfilled and almost collapsing on itself. So the, uh, the answer is option A. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Melissa. That's a very interesting talk. Um, next up, we have Dr. Hatem presenting on vexes, ultrasound assessment of systemic venous congestion. Um, before um, introducing Dr. Hatem, just a couple of reminders. Um, my e-certificate will be emailed after the webinar, um, so look out for it. Um, and also, please do ask your questions on the Q&A tab. Um, we will try and address as many questions as we can during the panel discussion at the end. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, so Dr. Hatem is a consultant in cardiothoracic intensive care at the Hatfield Hospital at the Royal Brompton and Hatfield Hospitals in London and an honorary senior lecturer at King's College London. He has an MSc in critical care echocardiography from Alexandria University, Egypt, and is a member of the Royal College of Physicians UK and National Board of Echocardiography USA. He also has a Diploma in Cardiology, London, UK, European Diploma of Intensive Care Medicine, and Postgraduate Diploma in Medical Education, Edinburgh. Dr. Hatem is a member of the Board and Counselor for Echocardiography, EACBI, and Editorial Board Member at JACC Imaging and Frontiers, Cardiovascular Imaging, Heart Transplantation. He, also, he is also an elected fellow of the Higher Education Academy of the UK, FHEA, FEACBI, and FESE, and an associate fellow of Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine of the UK. Dr. Hatton's clinical and research interests are point of care ultrasound, advanced echocardiography and critical care, and mechanical circulatory support, and heart and lung transplantation. Dr. Hatton, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zink, um, uh, Nink, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thanks for Dr. Suresh for inviting me. Good um, uh, afternoon, everyone. It's uh, still uh, the late of the morning here in London. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you in this uh, webinar and very delighted and uh, honored to be with all my colleagues and esteemed uh, colleagues uh, from uh, different countries in Asia. So I'm going to share my presentation which will aim to discuss the assessment of the systemic venous congestion with point of care ultrasound. Can you confirm if you can see my presentation? Confirm. Okay, perfect. Confirm. perfect. <clears throat> so I have no disclosures that relates to this presentation and the outline of the talk is to briefly touch upon the physiology of venous return discussing the validated protocol, the latest validated protocol <clears throat> for evaluating systemic venous congestion with point-of-care ultrasound, which is the VEXIS protocol, 
and also discussing a practical approach of how to perform vexes at the bedside. And while we do that, we will go through some important pitfalls to understand the limitations of each of these parameters. Like anything in point of care ultrasound, we should be aware of the limitations. So congestion is a very important thing in our evaluation in uh, uh, intensive care and anesthesia. And I always think of uh, the hemodynamic assessment in terms of congestion and perfusion. Uh, so once we uh, assess perfusion, we make sure that cardiac output is maintained. It is always important to assess congestion uh, on the left side of the heart and also on the right side of the heart. But traditionally, we used to look at congestion purely as the left-sided congestion. So we have deep knowledge of evaluating left heart filling pressures by echocardiography, by tissue Doppler. And also, lately, we started integrating lung ultrasound to give us more idea about left-sided congestion and the appearance of extravascular lung water. And the traditional hemodynamic parameters that we utilized to evaluate uh, hemodynamics at the bedside included the right atrial pressure or the CVP, which is one of the important and classic parameters at the bedside. But how do we look at the CVP? We traditionally used to look at the CVP as a surrogate for the right ventricular ability to handle preload. But we did not often think of the CVP as the downstream after load of the flow across the capillary beds in the organs. And if we look into this physiological equation, we will notice that increasing CVP with a maintained mean systemic filling pressure will equate to a reduction of perfusion at the capillary beds, which is an important thing to consider while we evaluate the CVP and while we talk about systemic venous congestion. And we have abundance of data in critical care in anesthesia, that excessive cumulative fluid balance uh, could lead to uh, increased morbidity and mortality, not only because of heart and lung congestion, but also because of congestion of the splenic, uh, uh, of the splenic organs, uh, the intestinal congestion, renal congestion, liver, splenic congestion, and even brain edema. And we, when we talk about critically ill patients, we used to, um, think that the story of the patient ends when they leave the intensive care unit. But we usually see patients or often see patients coming back to the intensive care unit because they leave the unit edematous, swollen. I, we call them survivors of critical illness. After receiving lots of intravenous fluids, they leave with a bit of uh, derangement in the kidney functions and gross edema. And I, I think it is not the end of the story because uh, we have emerging data that shows us that excessive cumulative fluid balance, even in level two care, after a patient goes out of intensive care unit, is linked to increasing complications. And that's an example of one of the latest studies, which is a retrospective analysis of a cohort of patients after cardiac surgery, which showed that excessive cumulative fluid balance 48 hours or more after cardiac surgery is linked to hyperactive delirium. And we know that delirium is one of the dilemmas we face in critical care without full understanding why it happens and how to best manage it. Could this be because of liver congestion, uh, because of excessive fluid overload, maybe? Could it be because of subclinical brain edema, because of fluid overload? It is not clear, but that could be a signal for us to link excessive cumulative fluid balance to delirium, which is one of the complications of ca after cardiac surgery. And it's always good to go back to physiology and try to refresh and uh, revisit our understanding of physiological concepts. We know that the Frank Starling curve was a great helpful tool for us to evaluate uh, preload responsiveness, as my esteemed colleague discussed in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, but the Frank Starling curve has a limitations because it only tells us that augmenting preload will augment stroke volume without telling us what happens on the dark side of the circulation, which is the blue curve, and that is the venous return side. And here you will notice, by the time you are increasing right atrial pressure, you are increasing the preload to augment stroke volume, there will be at some point substantial reduction in venous return, while you are still seeing increase in the stroke volume. So the perfusion and the stroke volume is not the whole picture. An important part of the picture is the venous return and the consequences of congestion 
at the systemic venous side. And that's why uh, this uh, study is one of the landmark studies in the last 10 years, which validated for the first time different parameters of systemic venous congestion in a scoring system that can be applied at the bedside to quantify systemic venous congestion and therefore act upon uh, accordingly by optimizing diuresis, optimizing inotropes to assess right ventricular preload. And the study itself found that postoperatively patients with significant congestion, the severe congestion, which was quantified as grade, grade three, according to the study, was associated with development of acute kidney injury. So how do we perform systemic venous congestion? We have different parameters. We start with the inferior vena cava as the gateway for the systemic veins, and then look further into the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the renal vein. And that would be the rest of my presentation, discussing each one of these parameters, how we perform it, and how we analyze it. We can perform uh, the approach, the protocol from the sub xiphoid uh, window for the IVC, hepatic, and portal vein. The kidney has to be from mid-axillary approach, but I actually prefer to perform the whole protocol from the mid-axillary approach because I find it much useful. And because I work in a cardiothoracic intensive care unit, I find it often challenging to perform the sub xiphoid position. So I highly recommend the sub xiphoid approach. So starting with the IVC, we probably all aware, uh, most of us are aware of the IVC assessment. Here I showed you the IVC in long axis window. However, the recommendation is to turn the probe 90 degrees and get the IVC in short axis because the IVC when it's empty, it is elliptical. And when the IVC is elliptical, you can easily overestimate the IVC diameter by doing it in the long axis position. So when you rotate 90 degrees, you get the short axis, then you can measure both the biggest and the shortest diameter of the IVC and take the average. And that's the recommended way of doing IVC assessment. The study tells us if the IVC is not dilated, you don't need to further proceed and do vexus because you will be very unlikely having systemic venous congestion with a non-dilated IVC. However, I recommend doing the rest of the protocol anyway, because I believe that all these parameters are like pieces of jigsaw puzzle. The more the pieces I have, hopefully the clearer the picture becomes. So obviously, if the IVC is dilated, there might be congestion, there might not be congestion. This is regardless of mechanical ventilation, uh, by the way, because the study uh, had almost 50% of the patients spontaneously breathing and the other 50% of patients were mechanically ventilated. And of course, we should be aware of the IVC pitfalls. There are situations which can cause dilatation of the IVC without necessarily having congestion in the systemic venous side, especially right-sided failure, pulmonary hypertension, cardiac tamponade, PE, tricuspid regurg, and there are situations which can cause false collapse of the IVC in the presence of systemic venous congestion, like status asthmaticus, pregnancy, for example, and increased intra-abdominal pressure. And when you perform the IVC assessment, be wary of the position of the probe, and moving in and out of, of, of plane could exaggerate IVC collapsibility, and you should also be careful of the hepatic vein confluence, because if you measure the IVC at the position of the hepatic vein confluence, you can easily overestimate IVC diameter, and definitely you should not mistake in the IVC for the abdominal aorta. They look very different. And important to look at the brightness of the aorta, start with the aorta and the look to tilt the probe to look for the IVC, which drains into the right atrium. So starting with the next part of the assessment, which is the hepatic venous waveform, I showed here the right atrial pressure waveform uh, alongside the hepatic venous uh, waveform to show you that the tracing is almost identical. Maybe the name of the waveform is different. We have different letters assigned to each part of the trace, but the physiology is the same. In hepatic vein, you should have predominantly anti-grade flow below the baseline, which means that the flow is moving anti-grade forward from the hepatic vein to the IVC. The flow is predominantly in systole, so you have a bigger systolic wave than diastolic wave, and you have only one point of reversal, which is the point of atrial contraction, which is the A wave of, uh, which is the P wave of the ECG trace. And obviously, because you're talking about systole and diastole, you should have an ECG connected to the ultrasound machine to understand the timing of the cardiac cycle. That is the normal hepatic vein waveform. How do we assess the hepatic vein? 
whether you will do the subsequent position or mid axillary position, you put the probe in the uh, uh, mid axillary position with the indicator towards the patient head. And then you look at the hepatic vein as it drains into the IVC and then tilting the tail of the probe down will give you the hepatic vein, which has an echoic wall, drains clearly into the IVC. And when you put color Doppler, the signal should be blue because the flow in the hepatic vein is moving away from the transducer. And then once you confirm that it's the hepatic vein by color Doppler, you apply pulsed wave Doppler, and then you will have this waveform that we just talked about together. So let's briefly analyze each part of this waveform. We talked about the A wave, which is the only point on cardiac cycle in which the right atrial pressure will be elevated. That's why we are normally non-swollen and non-edematous in health. Uh, and that is the point of atrial contraction. And that's the only point of reversal. And then you have the systole and diastole. And this is all forward flow across the hepatic vein to the IVC. During ventricular systole, the uh, flow moves forward from the IVC from the hepatic vein to the IVC due to atrial relaxation. And during ventricular diastole, there is also forward flow across the hepatic vein due to tricuspid valve opening. And the V wave is just an, a transitional wave. So it has no physiological significance. So, so when the right atrial pressure increases, the earliest sign of increase in the right atrial pressure, that's the normal trace, by the way, S larger than D, and it's a triphasic waveform. The earliest sign of rise of right atrial pressure is that the systolic forward flow becomes lower. So you have reversal of the relationship between systole and diastole. So the S becomes smaller than the D, but both of them are still below the baseline. You still have a triphasic pattern. You have A, S, and D. And once you have significant increase in right atrial pressure, enough to cause reversal of the S, of the S wave, to become above the baseline, this will cause the biphasic pattern, which is a severe abnormality of the hepatic venous waveform. But there are pitfalls, of course, because systolic reversal of the hepatic vein can also be seen in significant tricuspid regurgitation, not because of systemic venous congestion in the organs, but because of the leaky valve. So we have to keep this in mind when we do vector you have to make sure that there's no significant tricuspid regurgitation when you interpret the hepatic vein. And also, as you have noticed, and as I mentioned, important to have the ECG connected while you perform the hepatic venous assessment. Also keep in mind that certain pathological conditions might cause blunting of the waveform of the hepatic vein, including peri-arrest due to very low flow states, including significant liver pathologies, cirrhosis, extensive fatty infiltration, lymphoma, and even valve maneuver. We'll move to the next part of the assessment, which is an exciting part. And I find it a very useful aspect of assessment, which is the portal vein. Maybe it is new to uh, um, uh, some of you uh, who already know about the hepatic vein, but actually the portal vein assessment is very simple. And once you put the probe on the same position, tilting the tail of the probe up, you will often see the portal vein, which has different look compared to the hepatic vein. The portal vein typically has a bright line, a bright lining, which is different from the anechoic called uh, hepatic vein. And the portal vein, when you put color Doppler, it has a distinctive red signal because the flow in the portal vein moves towards the transducer. And also, before putting pulsed wave Doppler, if you look at the portal vein with color Doppler, it should have constant red signal. So that signal should not be pulsating. So the signal should not be flashing on and off. Because if it's pulsating, that indicates pulsatility in the portal vein, which will be confirmed when you put pulsed wave Doppler. On your left-hand side is a PW assessment of the portal vein, which is normally monophasic or only having pulsatility less than 30%. And from 30 to 50%, this is considered mild abnormality and more than 50%, this is considered severe abnormality. And you could see here, here even on your right-hand side that the pulsatility is more than 100%, which is definitely a severe abnormality. And why I said that the portal vein is more exciting because it is less affected by pitfalls compared to the hepatic vein. The portal vein, although it looks anatomically close to the hepatic vein, but physiologically it is very far. There is a big bundle of networks and sinusoids and capillaries between the hepatic vein and the portal vein, which buffers any direct transmission of right atrial pressure 
to the portal vein, which makes it more reliable to assess congestion in the gut and congestion in the splanchnic circulation. And here you have the example of color Doppler flashing pulsatile portal vein on your right hand side and the constant signal red color of the portal vein normally monophasic on the left hand side. And among the other pitfalls of uh, portal vein like hepatic vein, it can also be influenced by significant liver disease in the context of cirrhosis or fatty liver. It is also noticed, and we see it frequently in our courses, that healthy young uh, FIN volunteers, we, when they come for scanning uh, to help us in the courses, they can have portal vein pulsatility. Uh, and it is not clearly understood. Some theories uh, um, uh, consider that due to hyperdynamic circulation, if they are athletics, and some theories consider it transmitted pulsatility from the hepatic artery. But I personally think it, that a hump, it is a humbling reminder that we should always use the POCUS information within the clinical context. Using any single information blindly without the clinical context is a big mistake. And the final part and the trickiest part of the assessment is the renal vessels assessment. Here we have the kidney. Uh, if you are still in the mid-axillary line, you just move slightly posteriorly and downward to get the kidney in position. Zoom on the kidney uh, because the renal vessels have lower flow uh, velocity compared to the liver, you will need to uh, uh, make sure you reduce the Nyquist limit of the color Doppler scale to catch and pick these renal vessels. And you should also aim to pick and evaluate the interlobar vessels, which are located between the cortex and the medulla. So these flashing signals in the hilum should be avoided because they can overestimate uh, uh, the assessment, and these very tiny signals in the edge of the kidney should also be avoided. The ones you should assess are the interlobar vessels between the cortex and the medulla. And it's pretty much the same. Start with 2D, then color Doppler, and then pulse wave Doppler. And because the renal vessels are quite small, actually in this example, you are only seeing the vein, which is below the baseline, but in uh, Usual situations, you see the hepatic, uh, the sorry, the renal artery and the vein in the same position. So you have the arterial signal above the baseline and you have the venous signal below the baseline. The arterial signal is not part of the venous assessment, so you don't need to evaluate it, although it has useful information if you want to deeply uh, do more advanced assessment of kidney perfusion. But the vein is important part of the assessment. And here you don't need an ECG because the heart itself, the uh, renal arterial signal, can provide an internal ECG for you by giving you the time of systole. And then you will look at the venous flow, which should normally be non-interrupted, similar to the portal vein. So it should be monophasic, non-interrupted. If you have interruption of the renal vein, the timing of interruption is correlated to the, to the degree of congestion. So if you see isolated systolic and diastolic wave like here with a small area of interruption, that is mild abnormality. And if you see a long area of no flow with isolated diastolic wave and no visible systolic wave, that will be severe abnormality. And here is a real life patient uh, that we had a few months ago, uh, plethoric IVC, you had systolic reversal of the hepatic vein, which is severe abnormality, and you have portal vein pulsatility more than 100%. And this patient was clearly VEX score three, according to the protocol. And when you look here at the management of the patient after offloading over uh, three days, negative five liters with diuresis, there was improvement in the VEX assessment. The IVC is now less dilated, the hepatic vein is more anti-grade with no reversal in systole, and the portal vein is non-pulsatile. And this is not the only change. There was also change in the biochemical findings with the improvement of urea and creatinine and sodium levels. And that is the protocol put together. You have the uh, combination of the uh, parameters. Uh, if you have any combination of normal or mild abnormal parameters, that is considered grade one mild congestion. If you have one severely abnormal parameter, that is considered moderate congestion grade two. And if you have two or more severely abnormal parameters, that is considered severe congestion or VEX score three. And I will finish by uh, some pitfalls that relates to the whole protocol. If you see a patient with long-standing pulmonary hypertension, 
they are likely to have VEXA score three, which means severe congestion. So it will be a mistake if we aggressively offload these patients without evaluating stroke volume and LVOT VTI at the same time, because these patients, the stroke volume of the heart is adapted on high preload. So be careful in these patients and don't jump into aggressively correcting VEXA score because VEXAS could also be seen as a surrogate for right heart function and right heart preload. And that is the case in patients with right ventricular dysfunction. Also, if you see a patient with VEXA score 3, in any case, whether they are right heart failure or just fluid overloaded, I would not give them any fluids unless they have invasive hemodynamic monitoring, because there will be a higher chance of harm than benefit in this condition. It was also noticed that patients who have VEXA score 3 are likely to be diuretic resistant. So these are the patients who would benefit from combination of fruzamide, uh, thiazides, and spironolactone and other combination of diuretics. And finally, I think the importance of the systemic venous assessment is that it shifts our understanding from purely focusing on preload responsiveness to looking at when to stop giving fluids, which is the most important question then, when do we need to give fluids? And that is the concept of fluid tolerance. And remember that patients with significant tricuspid regurgitation you should not rely on the hepatic vein and the portal vein will be more reliable. And finally, this is my recommended approach, which is the pyramid of point of care ultrasound in hemodynamic and fluid assessment, where you have the cardiac ultrasound assessment, assessment of perfusion, left heart congestion, assessment of uh, lung congestion by lung ultrasound, and also assessment of systemic venous congestion. That is the protocol that I practice and I teach, and I do it almost in every single patient to try to deliver the best hemodynamic and fluid care for these patients. And finally, point of care ultrasound uh, is not without challenges. There are many challenges, including technology, governance, quality standards, accreditation, documentation, training. Uh, but I'm very optimistic, as all of you, uh, are optimistic about it because we are now seeing a broader interest in point of care ultrasound and wider availability of accreditation and training programs, which enable us to conquer the biggest challenges, which is in my perspective, the culture change and embracing the new era of bedside point of care ultrasound. And as part of this culture change, uh, I'm very delighted to share this work with you, which is our latest uh, newly published uh, textbook in cardiopulmonary point of care ultrasound, which was just published by Springer in October 2023. And it discusses in depth uh, the whole protocol with collaboration with 57 authors uh, from around the world. And these are my take home messages. I think fluid tolerance is important to be integrated to our assessment of fluid responsiveness. I think fluids should be treated as medications. We should prescribe fluids in the drug chart. We should write how much fluids for how long and when to stop them. And we should be careful of patients with right ventricular failure and long-standing pulmonary hypertension when we evaluate vexes and manage the patients accordingly. And I agree again, and I call for VEX score to be integrated in our bedside point of care assessment. And I hope I was able to convince you that it will be helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hatem. So next up, we have uh, Dr. Sunil, who will be presenting on hemodynamic assessment with neck vessels. Dr. Sunil is a senior consultant anesthesiologist at Singapore General Hospital, St. Kang General Hospital and National Heart Centre, Singapore. His subspeciality areas of practice include intensive care medicine, cardiothoracic anesthesia, regional anesthesia and perioperative medicine. He is also an adjunct assistant professor at Duke NUS Medical School and an examiner for the National MED Anesthesiology Exam. His clinical interests include medical education, simulation, human factors, global health, focus, and echocardiography. Dr. Sunil, please. Thanks so much, uh, Zengning. I'm trying to share my screen, but uh, I'm not being... Ah, okay, I got it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sending, for the very kind introduction. And thank you to GE and uh, to everyone for 
giving me the opportunity to present on uh, this interesting topic um, on neck vessels uh, for hemodynamic monitoring. So um, this is a lot more basic. And the idea here is to divide the focus assessment into something similar to what uh, we would do in an emergency. So a primary survey and a secondary survey. So the idea here is that this would fall inside the five minute quick airway breathing circulation assessment and initial stabilization period, where we just want quick information and uh, just to manage the initial situation. Um, and then following a little bit of period of stability, we can then do more complex measurements uh, when the patient is, is a little bit uh, more under control. So why monitor hemodynamics? Uh, it gives us quite a lot of information. We can differentiate the pattern of shock, identify occult shock or relative under resuscitation, and we can also monitor the triggers and endpoints for fluids, vasopressors, and inotropic uh, medications. But really importantly, it allows us to differentiate um, complications of uh, treatment. We're always worried, are we on too much noradrenaline, too much vasopressin? Why is the lactate up? Uh, what's going on? And we want to know, well, if the hemodynamics are optimized, then the lactate is rising for other reasons. So it's a, it's either a gut ischemia, liver failure, or um, something like that. Um, so that, that can help us being more certain that the circulation is optimized and we must look at other causes of a elevated lactate. Um, and also with enhanced recovery after surgery, there's some role for using uh, some kind of hemodynamic monitoring. So point of care ultrasound and an arterial blood gas together will allow us to differentiate most of our H's and T's in any kind of emergency. So the red ones can be differentiated very well with point of care ultrasound and the rest of them with a blood gas and, uh, and a bit of a history and clinical context. This is a screenshot of a, a cardiac output monitor. And I just wanted to compare uh, what, the, what kind of information it gives and what the assumptions are here. There are two major assumptions with uh, this sort of monitor. This is an arterial pulse contour cardiac output monitor. It assumes that the cardiac output from the left ventricle is equal to the microcirculatory flow throughout the entire body. And that is equal to the venous return to the right heart. And of course, the whatever the right heart puts out must be the same as what the left heart puts out, providing there's no intracardiac shunt. Uh, so that's the continuity equation applied to the whole circulation. The other major assumption is that we can't possibly know what the arteriovenous pressure gradient is within the microcirculation of the body. So on the arteriolar side, we don't know what that is. On the venular side, uh, that is what we would call mean systemic filling pressure during circulatory arrest. Uh, and so we substitute mean arterial pressure and CVP uh, for that. And that leads to two issues. One, we may, just from the formula, we may actually, if we, if we don't look at what cardiac output monitors are intended to do, uh, and we start talking about SVR, we may unintentionally give excessive vasopressor therapy and increase pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure risk. But here's the formula. Actually, total peripheral resistance is the sum of systemic vascular resistance across the microcirculation, as well as the resistance to venous return. So it's actually the ratio of mean pressure to mean flow. Systemic vascular resistance subtracts CVP. And so the difference between them has to be the resistance to venous return. And what that means is, as the CVP rises, the resistance to venous return rises, so back pressure from the right heart on the systemic venous system, and the pressure gradient across the microcirculation actually falls for, for the same constant flow. Um, so it's better to just look at mean arterial pressure and cardiac index directly and the determinants of them, rather than trying to titrate noradrenaline to SVR. That uh, SVR is a derived variable, and it's not accurate. It has a very, very wide range of uh, normal ranges, and that actually varies according to blood pressure and cardiac output. Um, so what you should do is just use fluid and vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure above 65, and then only add inotropes uh, to maintain a, a minimum cardiac index and not overdrive the heart. Um, the second issue with venous congestion or not recognizing venous congestion 
is that if we give too much fluid therapy, uh, it, 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 it may actually trick us into giving too much fluids because we fail to recognize that a lot of conditions can result in false positive responses to fluid, such as right heart failure, obstructive shock, and vasodilatory shock. So I'd like to show you these images here. If we look at the, uh, the image on the left, firstly, we look at uh, the heart, the systemic venous system, and all the venules of the whole body here. Firstly, the pressure gradient driving venous return in a continuous flow system model is the pressure gradient between mean systemic filling pressure or microcirculatory venular pressure and right heart uh, pressure, actually RVEDP. Of course, this is an active process with many active mechanisms, including right heart function, uh, respiratory function, and uh, patient position as well. Um, and the, the, the pressure gradient mathematically driving venous return would be the pressure difference between mean systemic filling pressure and central venous pressure. Um, now, on the venular side, venous return could fall for two reasons. One, an absolute drop in volume within the venous system from hypovolemia or vasodilatation. What a lot of people forget is that Actually, vasodilatation is not just arteriolar dilatation, but venular as well. It results in a lot of venous pooling on the venular side of the circulation within the hepatic uh, and the splanchnic circulation and the lower body veins as well. The other reason venous return may fall is from any compromise and back pressure from the right heart, including any cause of pulmonary hypertension, precapillary, capillary, or postcapillary, uh, extrinsic compression of the heart from intrathoracic pressure or cardiac tamponade. Um, or even great vessel compression here as well. This is actually a more accurate model of the circulation. This is the Krogh model of the circulation that was further built upon by Guyton uh, in, in future studies. And he described that physiologically or functionally, the systemic circulation has at least two functional compartments. One, a high resistance, low capacitance circuit. And two, the second one, a low resistance, high capacitance circuit. And it's just to say that in certain types of shock, particularly vasodilatory shock, we have to be careful because you can have infinite capacity of the venular system to accommodate more volume with a huge capacity for venous pooling, which may be superimposed on hypovolemia. And that causes a relative reduction in venous return. And that can cause a false positive response to fluids. Um, and also if you... Um, uh, it can also result in peripheral arteriovenous shunting in septic shock as well, with a failure of tissues to extract oxygen as well. So the way we differentiate shock states is by marrying three components together. A low output state, a reduction in cardiac output or stroke volume, venous congestion or a high CVP, and the presence or absence of preload responsiveness. Um, so hypovolemia and distributive shock, so under-distributive would include sepsis, anaphylaxis, or neurogenic shock. Um, all of those, uh, both of those, are not associated with systemic venous congestion. Whereas obstructive and cardiogenic shock are associated with venous congestion. Equally, uh, hypovolemia, obstructive, and cardiogenic shock are associated with a low cardiac output state. Whereas distributive shock, uh, at least in the early phases in most people, is normally associated with a normal or a high cardiac output. And uh, however, cardiac output may be depressed uh, later with secondary myocardial depression from septic cardiomyopathy. Now, the point of this is, uh, if you just looked at preload responsiveness in isolation, you'd be wrong in many, many cases because you can have false negative preload responses. So if you're extremely hypovolemic and hemorrhaging and exsanguinating, and you gave an insufficient fluid challenge, you may not get any kind of meaningful improvement in cardiac output, and you may falsely interpret that as a negative response, and you may not give any more fluid to the patient. Uh, equally, in uh, vasodilatory shock, you can get venous pooling, so the patient may get transient false positive responses of, to fluid, but these are not sustained. In any kind of obstructive shock, tension, pneumothorax, right heart failure, tamponade, they will make transient responses to fluid. That's not necessarily the diagnosis. And in cardiogenic shock, particularly right heart failure, you can certainly get false positive responses to fluid. Uh, in isolated right heart failure, the right ventricle is dilated, the interventricular septum is shifted paradoxically, and 
compresses the left ventricle and restricts left ventricular filling. So in small doses, fluid can help. But if you overdo it, um, you will actually further shift the interventricular septum towards the left and further compromise LV filling. Uh, so it's a self-defeating uh, process. In addition, you will get further venous congestion on the systemic side. So we've got to be careful, and we need all three components to make an accurate determination of what the hemodynamic state of the patient is. Okay, looking at CVP, this has been our mainstay of uh, measuring venous congestion in the, in the past. I'm pleased to say, not anymore. We don't routinely put central lines in every single patient. We are quite... Uh, uh, conscious about that, and we will put it in if it's needed. Uh, so the determinants of CVP are largely the the, the interaction between intravascular volume, uh, particularly on the venous side, uh, venous compliance and the capacity to dilate, as well as back pressure from the right heart as well. And it gives you a curvilinear relationship with intra intravascular volume. And what that means is uh, during right heart failure or high intrathoracic pressure, so obstructive or cardiogenic shock, um, actually the rate of rise of CVP as you give volume will be faster. And equally, when you have high venous compliance and a high capacity to take volume on the venous system, uh, the rate of rise of CVP when you administer volume to a patient will be slower. So actually to say that you should fill somebody to a certain number of CVP is not accurate at all. Uh, and actually you can see that ultrasound would be the most accurate, most sensitive marker of the endpoint for filling uh, compared to pressure-based measurements. The other bit of confusion, just to elaborate on this, is preload responsiveness. Uh, all that means is that the left ventricle is considered to be on the steep part of its styling curve, irrespective of whether it's failing or not, whereas central hypovolemia is defined as a low left ventricular end diastolic volume, i.e. the left ventricle is empty. It doesn't tell you anything about the right ventricle and you've got to be careful of that. So you've got to see both ventricles, really. Um, and this is just a, a, a schematic of a styling curve of a normal ventricle versus a failing left ventricle. And it's just to show both of them, if they're empty, will be preload responsive until they're not. Uh, so the lack of preload responsiveness means that the LV is full enough. Um, so how do we put all of this together? Well, the RUSH protocol uh, was probably the the game changer here, uh, rapid ultrasound and shock uh, by Philip Pereira and Dina Safe in early 2012. They actually classified shock based on IVC and IJV ultrasound. They said you could use either um, as flat or intermediate uh, in um, hypovolemic or distributive shock or distended in cardiogenic or obstructive shock. And that was uh, such an easy way to differentiate congestive versus non-congestive types of shock. Um, and they, they also pointed out way back then um, that you could use the jugular vein if you can't see the IVC. You can't always see the IVC in every situation. Um, sometimes the epigastric view is not available because of surgery in that area um, or abdominal pathology. And the right flank view is quite handy to, to be able to do, uh, but that's also not always present unless the vein is congested. Um, and the false protocol built on this as well, fluid assessment limited by lung sonography. This was by Daniel Lichtenstein, the blue protocol author, and suggesting that, look, in the first instance, exclude obstructive and cardiogenic shock, i.e. distended veins and B lines on the lungs. And if that's not present, go ahead, fill the patient until the veins are full, and then stop when the patient is no longer preload responsive and or you start to get a few B lines, and then start noradrenaline. So that's, that's quite a, a simple way of uh, initial resuscitation for a shock patient. Uh, so the wild classification of shock differentiates no venous congestion versus venous congestion. And the Stevenson classification of heart failure, which builds on the Killip and Forrester classifications, uh, use, um, actually do, does away with PA catheters and cardiac output monitors altogether. Instead of low cardiac output state, they just looked at peripheral hypoperfusion, yes or no, and dry or wet lungs, yes or no. And if we put that all together in one table, we have a single table that can tell us any hemodynamic or intravascular volume state of the patient. And we understand now that these things are dynamic. So you may start off with hypovolemic and distributive shock, 
um, and then end up with right heart failure or develop septic cardiomyopathy in the future and so on. Uh, so we can put it all together and we just accept that these things are quite dynamic and we have to be quite flexible and and be open to the idea that patients can have a mixed picture, uh, particularly after we start treatment. Um, the other thing we can do is differentiate true and false positive responses to preload responsiveness. So if we just looked at preload responsiveness in isolation, we said we'd be wrong. We have to look at the venous system as well, and we can differentiate whether it's a true or a false positive or negative. It goes, it gets better than that. We can actually have a pretest probability of what the heart would look like without even seeing it. We can look at the neck veins. We can look at preload responsiveness as a surrogate for LVEDP and uh, neck veins as a surrogate for right atrial pressure. And we can get a very, very good impression of the likely pathology that we're dealing with before we even get there. That's quite cool in, uh, in early resuscitation. It just starts to build the picture as you go along. You start with the neck, the lungs, the abdomen, and then I personally do the heart last uh, because I like to know where's the fluid, intravascular or extravascular, um, and then what's the heart doing. That, that's my approach. I find it uh, the quickest way of doing it. Okay, so how do we do it? So this presentation is all about the JVP, uh, jugular vein ultrasound and carotid Doppler uh, to build this picture for us. In the sitting position, doesn't matter if you're ventilated or spontaneously breathing, um, you can find the vertical height of the JVP simply by getting a transverse view of the jugular vein and scrolling, scanning all the way up from the clavicle, uh, careful lad, until the vein starts to collapse. Now, as veins collapse, the medial lateral diameter does not change. It's the AP diameter that changes as the veins collapse or distend. Yeah, so it's this diameter that we're looking at here. Uh, in the longitudinal view, you'll find actually there is a collapse point. And if you line that up with the middle of the transducer, then the vertical height of the JVP is exactly at that point. Um, this was a lovely paper published just uh, last, uh, now it's two years ago, <laughs> uh, we're in 2024. And they validated this really well in patients undergoing right heart catheter studies. Uh, so just prior to the invasive right heart catheter, they just did a jugular vein ultrasound and they identified the collapse point in the transverse view, the short axis of the IJ, and they divided the neck into four uh, quarters and they just qualitatively said, well, it's at the lower quarter, mid, upper third, uh, upper quarter, and, and so on. And they validated its correlation with uh, right atrial pressure uh, very well. Very good correlation uh, with an area under the curve almost in the high point eights here. Uh, in cardiac surgery, whether you're spontaneously breathing or ventilated, um, here what they did was uh, they actually measured the vertical height of the JVP in centimeters, converted that to millimeters of mercury, um, and then correlated that with invasively measured CVP. And they saw the same thing. There was a less than one millimeter of mercury difference between ultrasound JVP and right atrial pressure as measured when, as measured by CVP. What about ventilated patients in the supine position? Well, IJV distensibility index, if you just take a transverse view at the level of the thyroid gland and put an M-mode cursor through it, uh, you can actually get respiratory variations just as you would with IVC M mode. Uh, and that correlates with pulse pressure variation and fluid responsiveness in mechanically ventilated septic patients. Uh, does it correlate with the IVC? Yes, it does. You know, there are two formulae for IVC distensibility index, uh, the difference over the mean and difference over the minimum diameter. And they have different cutoff values of 18 and 12%. Uh, this one does correlate with both. Now, is it practically useful? Well, look at this study. This is a series of patients who presented with acute decompensated heart failure. They were now diuresed to the point where their veins started to collapse a bit. Okay, so at baseline, look at patient A here. The vein is hugely distended. And during a valsalva or a cough maneuver, there's no change in area. The vein's already as full as it possibly can be. After a period of diuresis and heart failure management, uh, the vein starts to look a bit smaller. And during a valsalva or a cough, there's some distensibility of it. So it has capacity now. 
If you compare that with patient B, where even after initial management, there's no change in jugular venous size, so right atrial pressure remains elevated, um, what you're saying is, uh, what they found was the risk of 30-day readmission with acutely compensated heart failure was higher in the patients who had an inadequate diuresis. So you can use the jugular vein not just as an endpoint for filling, but also as an endpoint for diuresis as well. So that's quite handy uh, because we we are always faced with both questions in in uh, acute care. You know, initially we want to fill patients, and then after a while we we might want to diurese them. So it's nice to know when to stop. This is me. I just wanted to demonstrate. I uh, just wanted to find out if I could do it on myself, um, and I can. So this is me standing up, and as we know, during the standing position, our IJVs are completely collapsed. And I put a pulse oximeter on myself here, and I valsalvered in the standing position. It makes you quite dizzy when you do that, and you can see that my uh, pulse amplitude and stroke volume must have been quite low, um, and my neck vein distended. Uh, that's great. My LV was not full and my RV was not full, so I don't have heart failure. Um, and then I made myself head down and just to see if there was any change. And again, my neck vein was really full in the head down position and I valsalvered, there was minimum change. And of course there was minimum change in my stroke volume as well. This correlates with outpatient, a very old method of assessing heart failure in the clinic uh, using a valsalva maneuver um, and looking at pulse oximetry waveforms as well as neck vein ultrasound together. And those studies correlate with BNP levels and echo-derived EF as well. Systematic review of IJV ultrasound versus CVP in spontaneously breathing patients. If you have an AP diameter of less than 7 millimeters, it correlates with a CVP less than 10. And if you have any kind of visible area change during dynamic respiratory maneuvers, that also shows a low CVP and venous capacity to take more volume, i.e. you're not overloaded, you do not have systemic venous congestion, it's safe to try a bit of fluid. Uh, what about its overall diagnostic performance in the diagnosis of hypovolemia or hypervolemia? It's got very good correlation with both. Now, can we move on from, uh, from that? You know, the, the Rush protocol talked about flat, intermediate, or full veins, but I always uh, find it's a bit of a challenge when you start to get intermediate veins, you know, because you can have... in oval shaped veins, which are kind of not collapsing, but they're still fairly compliant. You know, you press on the neck vein, it's still quite easy to compress. That's different from a vein that's starting to get a bit tense and distended uh, with high pressures in it. Would the flow profile in the vein change? So I, I draw your attention to this paper from 1978, where they used, uh, they measured jugular vein Doppler, and you find pretty much the same waveform as you would with hepatic vein Doppler, no surprises there. You know, so this is systole. Uh, second heart sound here, and then diastole after that. So you have a systolic peak and then a diastolic wave after that with systolic dominance. Yeah? And as you get progressive venous congestion, you get more systolic blunting and in tricuspid regurg, you get systolic, systolic flow reversal. Uh, same. If you can actually uh, image the innominate vein, you can kind of just see the proximal innominate simply by following the IJ in the short axis down to the clavicle, uh, flattening the transducer and externally rotating it about 20, 30 degrees. It often brings out the innominate vein, a great view for tracking your guide wire uh, before you dilate, uh, when you're placing central lines. You can actually get a perfect alignment of the Doppler signal. But for the studies I'm going to show you, they didn't even need to do that. They simply just looked at the IJ in the neck and put a Doppler across it. Um, so here we go. Uh, this was using a, a wireless device that's now being uh, marketed or, or studied. Um, so because they had such a wide sampling gate of their Doppler, <clears throat> they were able to get a carotid artery and a jugular venous waveform at the same time. And they showed something very similar to what the VEXA score shows. Um, during non-congestive states, you have a laminar continuous flow in the internal jugular vein and innominate vein, which correlates with systolic dominance in the hepatic veins. Do you remember the, our, our previous uh, speaker demonstrated on, on simple color flow? Uh, in the hepatic veins, it should be nice and blue, just blue laminar flow, like a waterfall, just moving anti-grade. And that's what you have here in non-congestive state. Uh, now, when you go head down, uh, then it you should get more systolic blunting here. This is actually wrong. Uh, it should be S less than D, according to this. Here's another study in trauma and hypovolemia. 
and they demonstrated increased pulsatility, i.e. the difference between peak velocity and end diastolic velocity, divided by the, the peak velocity in the jugular venous flow profile. Uh, so as the systolic dominance increases, uh, the patient is more and more hypovolemic in the context of trauma. And look at this uh, ROC curve. They actually showed um, that if you combine jugular vein Doppler with base excess, it has a very, very high sensitivity and specificity, to the highest to predict hypovolemia in traumatic uh, shock uh, compared to all these other measurements uh, in isolation, including lactate. Uh, so, so that's quite, quite useful. So very sensitive. So in summary, 2D assessment can uh, classify IJV as flat, intermediate, or full and identify the ultrasound JVP. Um, and you can further differentiate intermediate veins into grades of venous congestion. And this is sensitive to changes in position as well. Now, moving on to the arterial side. Um, so Blanco decided that the rush protocol should be correlated, uh, should be, we should add LVOT VTI to the rush protocol. So we should have some kind of measurement of stroke volume. And he recognized that actually, if you cut the LVOT wrongly, tangentially or obliquely, you will underestimate its size and you will square that um, and uh, compound the error in the area measurement. So he suggested, hey, how about just LVOT VTI? Just take the number. And he came up with a number of 18. So anything less than 18 signifies a low output state. Now, just to give you a reference range for what LVOT VTI should be, we know that when we're separating patients from venoarterial ECMO, uh, we would aim for a minimum LVOT VTI of 10 to 12 centimeters. Uh, and 18 is, is Blanco's cutoff for the a very, very mild reduction in stroke volume. So 18, 15, 12 are your cutoffs for mild, more severe reductions in stroke volume. So definitely, if you are using LVOT VTI, just use VTI. Don't use, don't, don't do the area. There's no need to do any calculations. You can just read it off the screen. Very easy, very quick. Now, can you use other arteries? Well, we know that there has been a, a previous machine, the esophageal Doppler machine, um, that's still in use. And there's a non-invasive version of this called the USCOM ultrasound cardiac output monitor that allows you to put it on the aortic area, the pulmonary area, or the suprasternal region as well. And it'll give you pretty similar numbers as this, uh, both cardiac output and a magic number called flow time or left ventricular ejection time. It also actually can calculate the area of the upstroke between the onset of systole or aortic ejection and peak velocity here. So the gradient of this is a marker of LV contractility or rate of rise or DPDT max. Uh, the ejection time is inversely related to systemic vascular resistance or excess afterload. So what that means is as your stroke volume falls from hypovolemia or excess vasoconstriction, you have uh, a very, very spiky, narrow waveform. Whereas as your stroke volume falls from LV impairment, you'll get a broader with a lower peak velocity type waveform with a more with a more curved appearance. And eyeballing that, you can see all these various uh, qualitative impressions of myocardial depression and changes in preload and afterload uh, and what happens after you intervene. So with preload, you have a spiky high velocity waveform. You increase the preload, the, the waveform gets broader and the heart rate slows. That's a correct response. Uh, you reduce an increased afterload uh, and you get a, an increase in the area under the curve as you'd expect. Um, and if you improve myocardial depression, this is specifically LV depression uh, with, with an inotrope, uh, you get a better waveform as well. And these are there are quantitative numbers that can be measured from that. So can you use this with peripheral arteries as well? There's plenty of studies out there that show that as far as respiratory variations in peak velocity go, you can use the carotid, brachial, femoral, or aortic Doppler, and they all predict preload responsiveness. Uh, and the cutoff value is between 10 and 12%, exactly the same as an arterial pulse contour analysis, and exactly the same as plethysmographic variability index as well. So um, if you don't have an arterial line in and your pulse oximeter can't measure PVI, then uh, this could be a useful trick that you could use. Um, now, what about just the base of the waveform, just looking at time alone? Does systolic time, or specifically LV ejection time, the time from aortic valve opening to closure, predict anything? Now, I take you back to some studies in the early 60s from Weisler and colleagues that 
studied systolic time intervals as measurement tools uh, in heart failure, and they definitely do correlate with ejection fraction, reduce the EF. Um, and the difference between just looking at the base of the waveform and the whole envelope, the whole area under the curve is, the area under the curve gives you stroke volume. The base of the waveform gives you stroke volume in relation to afterload. So it will be more sensitive or specific for changes, excess vasoconstriction, high afterload, or reduced ejection fraction. So it's not a pure measure of stroke volume. It has a more distinct cutoff, uh, not a pure, nice linear relationship. Uh, it's a it's more of a binary yes no type uh, answer, and this was correlated by Polak and colleagues with a carotid Doppler ejection time of less than three hundred and twenty one milliseconds. Correlates with moderate LV impairment with an EF less than forty percent. Um, so, uh, just to confirm. Compared to esophageal Doppler, the cutoff we were using there was 330 to 350 milliseconds, so very, very close. There have been studies of brachial artery tonometry as well, uh, not, not ultrasound, but simply pressure-based measurements, non-invasively, um, uh, which show only a five millisecond difference between carotid and brachial artery uh, ejection time. So you can use pretty much any proximal artery. You can't use the radial arteries in the snuff box or anything further for time-based measurements because it starts to get prolonged the further away from the central circulation you go. So the furthest you should go is brachial or femoral. Uh, but since we we find the, the neck vessels quite easy to see, uh, the carotid is usually accessible in most patients, but not in all. If, for example, trauma patients, burns patients, you may not have access to every single vessel. And so you just have to just go wherever, wherever you can. So this is an uh, apical five-chamber view just showing you LVOT Doppler and just showing you that you can use LV ejection time. And on aortic valve M mode in the parasternal long axis view, this is simply the time from aortic valve opening to aortic valve closure. So you could use both numbers. They're basically the same number, whether you measure by Doppler or M mode, very, very minor changes between the two. Um, and you can measure it with carotid Doppler as well. You get pretty much what looks like an arterial pressure waveform, but this is an arterial flow velocity versus time wave waveform, and you get a distinct dichrotic notch. And all you do is you measure the time from uh, onset of ejection to the dichrotic notch, as well as the cardiac cycle time from the neck from the onset of this to the onset of the next cardiac cycle. You have to then divide it by the cardiac cycle time, uh, the measured ejection time to correct for heart rate, so the automated machines give you that automatically, but uh, unfortunately, it's not. This is not a standard feature of all uh, point of care ultrasound machines yet. But I hope it will be. I'll just demonstrate what it looks like if you were to do it uh, simplistically. Uh, this is a table I made uh, uh, one afternoon when I had a lot of time on my hands. And if you just simply input heart rate on this column here and a measured ejection time over here, uh, you can actually the yellow would represent the normal ranges and you can work out a corrected uh, flow time or LV ejection time on carotid Doppler uh, using a simple table method. This is quite handy when you're in full PPE in, you know, during COVID or uh, an infected patient or, or some kind of situation. If you have a laminate, laminate on your ultrasound machine, you simply do a carotid Doppler, measure the, the width of the, the baseline, um, and just look at the screen for the heart rate, and you can just get an instant number. I'm hoping that uh, future... Uh, manufacturers will start incorporating this automatically because clearly there's a lot of beat to beat variation and pulse pressure variation um, in in a lot of patients. So it would be nice to automate and uh, average out a, uh, you know at least 20, 30 cardiac cycles compared to what we can do with manual measurements. Uh, what about cardiac output? That's the holy grail, isn't it? You know, this gives us, as I say, some caveats. It's more correlated with ejection fraction and excess vasoconstriction and afterload. Uh, what about cardiac output? You know, can we can we use this as a surrogate or not? And this this study, Marika Gasner's study, was very encouraging. And she said that, yes, you can. Now, this is interesting. Some of the earlier studies on carotid VTI used the radiology protocol for assessing cerebral blood flow. So what they picked is a point that was close to the carotid bifurcation, much higher up than where this study went. And they encountered a different problem so it did correlate very well with passive leg raise and VTI changes uh, in preload responsiveness. But in, in terms of absolute cardiac output, there was some variation. Some studies said yes, some studies said no, uh, and quite a wide uh, limits of agreement as well. 
So what these authors did is they went low down at the level of the thyroid cartilage, no, thyroid gland, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's very easy to see. Um, scan lower down in the neck, you'll see the thyroid gland here, the carotid artery is the one right next to it. And then you long access it here. And they found a near perfect correlation between a range of different methods of measuring cardiac output from PA catheter to pulse contour cardiac output monitoring, almost linear, almost perfect uh, relationships. It didn't matter whether you measured it on the left side or the right side, they measured the majority in the left. There were no body habitus or gender specific differences. And it didn't really matter if you're an experienced sonographer or a novice, uh, anyone could do this. So that's quite nice. Um, but Blanco then wanted to clarify that further. Blanco, the same guy as the Rush VTI guy, um, he said, uh, there's a difference. You know, when the machine traces out the VTI for you, automated, um, there's a difference between time average peak velocity, time integral, and time average mean velocity, time integral. So which one should we use? And Blanco suggested that flow in the carotid arteries, he agreed, you should measure it low down in the common carotid, not where the carotid bifurcation is, because that one is more sensitive to changes in cerebral blood flow and can be artifactual. We're really interested in changes in common carotid artery blood flow low down in the neck at the level of the thyroid gland. You should use a very, very wide sampling gait, and you should use the mean velocity. However, this is a subject of debate because Gassner actually used the peak velocity uh, time integral. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll wait and see what the studies, what future studies say about that. Blanco also said that you should measure area. So he's, he's changed his tune completely. Uh, when he talked about LVOT VTI, he said, just use the VTI. No need to measure the diameter of the LVOT. But now he's saying, oh, you should measure car carotid artery VTI. Uh, sorry, a diameter, and you should measure it in systole at its widest point. Because you can see here, there can be a three, four millimeter difference between diastole and systole. Uh, and you, again, you measure internal diameter to internal diameter or leading edge to leading edge. Um, you've got to be quite accurate about this. It has to be perpendicular to the orientation of the artery as well. Um, so what's the evidence? Uh, so this is a nice systematic review. Uh, just putting it all together for us telling us where to measure. This is the thyroid gland, short axis, carotid artery, common carotid, internal jugular vein here. Uh, we should measure the diameter there. The angle of incination should be less than 60. You should use the angle correct function and just line it up as parallel as you can to the direction of flow. And there are various measurements, including time-based measurements and VTI-based measurements that can be done. And here are the correlations, the best ones, with the extremely good correlations for cardiac output are with the VTI during various dynamic maneuvers, um, as well as flow time. Would you believe it? So a simple time-based measurement, as well as the entire VTI, correlate extremely well uh, with changes in cardiac output. And how about preload responsiveness? The same, flow time and VTI both correlate very well, well with preload responsiveness. So putting it all together, if we looked at uh, that table I showed you at the beginning, we can classify shock as with or without hypoperfusion on the vertical axis here and with or without congestion. Now, here's the thing. If we're looking at preload responsiveness, we're talking about what the LVEDP is likely to be. If we're looking at systemic veins, we're looking at what the RVEDP is likely to be. And if we're looking at lung water, uh, we're looking at whether they're B-lines or uh, you know, third space collections, pleural effusions, ascites, and so on, uh, present or not. Now, you can have variations in all of these. The, unfortunately, life isn't fair, and, and patients can have differences, especially when you start diuresing patients uh, or they start to develop various patterns of heart failure. It doesn't always uh, behave predictably. So you do have to put the whole picture together to get a snapshot of what somebody's shock and volemic status is at any one point in time. And that changes all the time. So you have to be open to the idea that uh, things can change. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunil. The questions are definitely flying in fast and furious after your talk. Um, our next speaker um, will be Dr. Sheridan bin Mohammed Fathil, who will be presenting on perioperative lung ultrasound.
So Dr. Sharivan obtained his MBBS from the University of Malaya in 1996. He underwent anesthesia training initially in Malaysia and then Ireland and England. He has also completed a regional anesthesia fellowship in the Royal Perth Hospital, Western Australia, and was appointed as a consultant and later senior consultant with Alexandra Hospital and Ng Teng Fong General Hospital, Singapore, for nearly six years until April 2017. He was also appointed as clinical senior lecturer with NUS Young Rudin School of Medicine and was the trainer for the basic and advanced regional anesthesia modules of the NUHS Anesthesiology Residency at Ottingham General Hospital. He is a consultant anesthesiologist in Glen Eagles Hospital, Medani Johor, Malaysia. His passions are ultrasound guided regional anesthesia and point of care ultrasound. He was the past convener for the Special Interest Group in Regional Anesthesia, College of Anesthesiologists, Academia, um, Acad Academy of Medicine Malaysia, and was one of the past presidents for the Society of Crit Critical and Emergency Sonography in Malaysia. He is also one of the members of the Clinical Governance Advisory Committee of IHH Malaysia, pushing for the adoption of regional anesthesia in the group. He has been on humanitarian relief work in post-natural and complex disaster missions in Indonesia, Philippines, Pakistan, Iraq, and Bangladesh. Dr. Sharidan, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let me just share my screen. Um, okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to have a very good evening. I'm wary of the time. Uh, I'll try my best to at least give a significant amount of time at the end for discussion and Q&A. So this is my talk. Uh, and this is where I currently work at the moment. It's a 100 odd bedded uh, multi-specialty surgery hospital down south, just a bit north of uh, Singapore. And we do quite a bit of what I like to think regional anesthesia. This is my colleague, Dr. Ng, who's actually doing a post thoracotomy ESP block. And we do a bit of uh, other point of care stuff. This is uh, myself doing or assisting my ENT surgeon who was uh, uh, basically uh, trying to feel uh, he, the, the patient was planned for uh, an actual uh, formal tracheostomy, but he was having some difficulty in, in feeling. Oh, uh, palpating the neck. So I and I brought the ultrasound in and showed where the things are. And in this particular uh, uh, slide, in this particular picture, uh, was myself actually doing uh, a referred to do a, a, a pleural drainage. Uh, we don't um, currently, this, uh, we, I, I don't get this kind of referrals anymore because we do have uh, an interventional radiologist at the moment. Okay, as uh, rightly pointed out by the chair uh, person that uh, I'm affiliated with the College of Anesthesiologists, uh, Academy of Medicine Malaysia, and I am affiliated with WinFocus, and as rightly pointed out also, I am uh, was one of the past residents for the local um, uh, chapter, so to speak. Uh, my involvement with Point of Care also Sound has always been um, uh, very much WinFocus because uh, they came over in 2008, the founding fathers, uh, uh, Luca Neri and Enrico Stotti, and we started off um, uh, point, point of care ultrasound uh, with uh, their uh, guidance. Uh, all, I'm also one of the um, uh, deputy editors for our new journal, and uh, I welcome uh, any contributions. Okay, let's just go a bit of history. Uh, it was only in 2011 that uh, uh, the use of lung ultrasound uh, came into the literature of uh, anesthesiology. Before that, in emergency medicine and uh, intensive care medicine, uh, there have been numerous publications, numerous guidelines, but it was only in this particular one in 2011 where the authors documented uh, the two cases where they actually diagnosed pneumothorax using lung ultrasound. And in the same um, uh, issue, uh, the editors came out with this editorial, if I could read it, if TE, vascular access, and regional anesthesia represent establish uh, mainstream uh, applications of period ultrasound, chest ultrasound, and other modalities have emerged more recently among anesthesiologists. This was way back in 2011. And in the particular, and in the same year, uh, New England Journal of Medicine came out with this uh, review article. And if you could 
right on top anesthesia, there's only a few applications here, uh, ultravascular access, guidance for access RA and intraoperative uh, fluid uh, and status and cardiac function. So there are not many at that particular point in time. We have progressed so far, and I'm just going to highlight this uh, particular ed editor. There was actually uh, a lot of the subspecial anesthesia subspecialty uh, literature journals were actually publishing uh, since then on point of care ultrasound. And this was one in RAPM, our regional anesthesia pain medicine. Uh, we started in 2017 to publish a lot of uh, point of care uh, ultrasound articles, uh, review articles, and it started off uh, about uh, 2017. So that's, that's, uh, that's about uh, uh, six, seven years ago. Okay, um, just to revisit what was published earlier. This was actually one of the first um, diagrams. Just going to show. This was actually published by Luca Neri, Enrico Storti, and Lena Linchenstein, the forefathers or the founding fathers of uh, Wind Focus. And you can see this is the A, B, C, D, E uh, approach of um, critical ultrasound, where they coined the word critical ultrasound. And more recently, we could see that uh, the anesthesiologists also are coming up with uh, things like this. Um, uh, foresight, focus, operative risk evaluation, sonography involving gastroabdominal, hemodynamic, and transthoracic ultrasound. You could see uh, most of the modalities of point of care ultrasound is incorporated in this protocol. And just to highlight, uh, I just like to quote this particular article. Uh, it was published in 2021, but the authors were looking at all the publications, perioperative point of care ultrasound. And it was only in the last five years that the majority of the, the you could see a lot of publications coming out more recently. Uh, and there was, uh, when they uh, reviewed the publications over 10 years, 78% of it were published uh, in the last uh, five years. This was uh, around 2021. So a bit of introduction. Uh, we know for lung ultrasound, uh, this was uh, Dana Linchenstein's article, which was published in 1991. And in that particular article where he recorded or documented uh, the use of uh, uh, critical care ultrasound, there was only about five cases of um, uh, lung ultrasound, uh, empyema, effusion, and another effusion. So uh, this was actually the start uh, of, uh, I would say, the first documentation of lung ultrasound, uh, and it was in a critical care journal. Uh, Wind Focus came up with this 2020, 2012 uh, international-based, evidence-based recommendations for point-of-care ultrasound. The lead author was uh, Giovanni Volpicelli, and I understand one of the, uh, I think the uh, second speaker also uh, is publishing a book uh, with uh, Volpicelli as one of the editors. So uh, there's a long list of uh, of authors uh, who have uh, who are key opinion leaders in lung ultrasound uh, who wrote this particular and this is one of the um, uh, one of the ICM most um, reference uh, one of the most reference um, article. Okay, coming back again. So how uh, am I going to pitch this? I think I'm just going to probably uh, do this talk uh, as a quick overview and mainly targeting beginners or say novices uh, for lung ultrasound. Okay, and uh, after that 2011 uh, uh, anesthesiology article or case series of two pneumothorax, BJA published this in, as a letter to editor in 20, 2012. And this was uh, the lung consolidation airborne program uh, documented in this uh, letter to editor. And subsequently after that, there were quite a bit of, um, I would say, uh, uh, Articles, uh, for example, looking at, at atelectasis in this particular one in children. Uh, again, uh, recruitment and looking at lung atelectasis um, in children. Uh, I will highlight this a bit later. Okay, and and this was the review article in part of the series in RAPM. Uh, one of the things that they pointed out was, uh, for example, to assess um, the freeing nerve palsy. Of course, some of the regional anesthesia techniques, uh, particularly uh, interscaline or supraclavicular blocks, uh, may render the patient to uh, uh, may basically may cause the patient to have free nerve palsy, and you can actually document uh, the free nerve palsy or uh, hemidiaphragmatic uh, uh, paralysis by using lung ultrasound, which I highlight to I will highlight to in a short while. Uh, this is again uh, looking at uh, lung ultrasound for complications in cardiothoracic surgery, and I just like to highlight this particular quite interesting where uh, this. Uh, the group of authors, what they did was actually looking at patients, post-op patients, uh, and they were looking at a prediction of post-operative pulmonary complications. And we can actually uh, give scores. So basically, uh, a normal lung, and when there's more B lines, uh, there's 
uh, I would say subplural consolidations and a bit confluence of B lines and a bit more consolidation. And they kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the points go up as uh, the, uh, there is worsening of the lung ultrasound. And they kind of uh, put on the scores and the authors concluded that at, at 24 hours, if you have a score of about five, uh, then it will kind of predict uh, that the patient will end up with some degree of postoperative pulmonary complication. So it's something quite interesting that actually with lung ultrasound, you know, you can diagnose a lot of things, but you can also predict that the, when the patient is uh, most likely going to turn bad. Okay, a little bit of how to, I'm going to uh, run quickly through. So you can use, uh, most of the time, we'll just need a linear or curvy linear, but in the literature, all this have been used for lung ultrasound. And if we screen, uh, we use the longitudinal as well as transversal in between the ribs. And in, in terms of documentation, this is the one, two, three, four. And if you turn the patient around, of course, in most situations, in the perioperative period, it may be a bit difficult to do this. Okay, and I'm just going to quickly run through. We're going to show what is normal. And you can see that, that is the sliding sign. And there are the reverberations of the sliding sign. This is the, where the pleura is. And these are the reverberations, what we call A lines. And these are actually normal or physiological. Okay. Okay, and we put, uh, this is uh, something important. And this is actually a, a, a fast view of uh, focused assessment sonography of trauma. This is important, particularly when we are looking at uh, the basis, because we want to know what we, where we are looking at. Are we looking at the in abdomen or in thorax? But this is uh, technically the diaphragm, and we can see uh, the liver, the kidney. These are the, this is the Morrison's pouch, the hepatorenal recess. And this is important. Uh, this is uh, one of the views that we use to assess um, hemidiaphragmatic paralysis, uh, uh, particularly in the case of renal anesthesia, is the phrenic nerve palsy. Okay, on the other side is actually the spleen, kidney, and diaphragm. It's a, probably a bit, um, a bit uh, more cephalate and a bit more uh, posterior. Okay, what is abnormal? Okay, I'm just going to quickly highlight the four main pathologies: effusion. Okay, this is what you're going to see on top of the diaphragm. And in some situations, you will also be able to see a collapsed lung, atelectic deep lung, uh, which appears like this. Okay, and another uh, concept is this interstitial syndrome. Uh, technically, it's any, it's basically interlobar septal thickening in, in uh, most uh, in patients with acute pulmonary as well as other uh, modalities. And what you will see uh, is this, technically B lines, which actually lines originating, uh, hyperechoic lines, which uh, moves with the pleura originating from the pleura right down to the bottom of the ultrasound image. I'm not going to go into great detail of, of the, how it is generated, but this is what you're going to, you can see this in uh, all the situations from palm edema, pneumonia, contusion, ERDS, and it can be a mixture of, of, of uh, uh, interstitial as well as other uh, pathology. So when you have palmary edema, you will see this. And in the worst case scenario, you will see the confluence of the B lines as well as uh, effusion. Okay, and what about pneumonia? Pneumonia is technically when you, uh, th this is not an artifact, it is actually an actual image. And this is, uh, you will see signals coming down from the actual lung itself. And in the worst case scenarios, you will get what we call hepatization, which actually the lung appear as if uh, uh, like, um, a liver and these are actually air bronchograms, uh, uh, which signifies that the uh, the actual alveolar area is is uh, consolidated. Okay, one interesting thing that uh, it's actually you could actually differentiate between true consolidation and atelectasis is uh, by using uh, the air bronchograms. And another point that uh, with ultrasound, it's much easier to actually look for effusion as compared to uh, other uh, pathologies. And also, of course, you know, you may want to tap this, uh, drain this rather than drain the one on the right. Okay, just a quick uh, on how to actually do a, a scan for pneumothorax. So uh, this is, if you have this, you know that the patient 100% with as pneumothorax. This is what we call a lung point. So when the more uh, dependent area, the lung point is the, the larger the pneumothorax is. 
Okay, and this is another one, what we call a lung pulse. Uh, the lung pulse, if you have a pneumothorax, the lung pulse will not be visible. Technically, it's the cardiac pulsation, which is transmitted to the chest wall. Okay, this is uh, what Lynchstein uh, 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 wrote uh, or classified as the A, B profile and the mixture of A, B profile. Okay, and also the bleed protocol, which I won't go into great detail. So again, how we, we are now, we have progressed in terms of, you know, ultrasound, we have more uh, uh, mobile or ultra mobile. And also there have been uh, quite a number in the market. And this was still way back in 2008, uh, where there were the BMG, where they were actually uh, writing about what was available then. But now definitely there's dem democratization, accessibility to um, handheld devices is uh, widely available. Uh, there have been review articles writing about this. Uh, personally, I I we have Clarius apart from our um, card-based uh, systems. Uh, I think it's time to add the fifth pillar to our bedside. This was a JAMA a special communication in April 2018. And I think uh, for us anesthesiologists, uh, not so much for the intensivists as well as uh, other uh, uh, medical um, specialty. I think it's about time for us to embrace focus and then for us to just, uh, you know, expand our uses from just lines to regional anesthesia, but to use uh, the other modalities as well. Uh, we need to you know, migrate from auscultation to insulation. Thank you very much. This is just to highlight uh, one of the workshops where I was a faculty 2013 that you can see Volpicelli, uh, Volpicelli here and, and Lynchstein in, in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sher. Um... So uh, we'll, we'll move on to the panel discussion. I just want to quickly introduce um, our esteemed group of uh, international panelists. So from the UK, we have Dr. Hatem. Um, from Malaysia, we have Dr. Hasmizi, Dr. Azarina, Dr. Sharidan. From the Philippines, we have Prof. Tano, Dr. Melissa. From Thailand, we have Dr. Tawivat. And from Singapore, we have Dr. Sunil, Prof. Chia, uh, Prof. Chia Yuun, Dr. Prit. Um, Dr. Lau Yihui, Dr. Suresh, um, and myself will be moderating this panel discussion. So we'll hand over the time over to Dr. Suresh to kickstart our panel discussion. Uh, hi, thank you, Zaneng. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the speakers and panelists and to everyone at GE Healthcare for supporting this webinar as well and making this webinar possible. Uh, we have quite a number of panelists from different specialties and different countries. Uh, we also have quite a lot of questions to go through, but our time is probably limited as, as it's quite late now in Asia. Uh, so I'll just start off with the with, uh, first question from... Uh, some, uh, I really enjoyed the three three talks on hemodynamics uh, today. They are fluid responsiveness, vexus, and uh, using the neck vessels. Uh, some some aspects of access and fluid responsiveness can be quite quite scary or challenging for for someone who's just starting out uh, in focus. Uh, is there any advice to to a newbie uh, who wants to evaluate fluid responsiveness? Is there any is there one single measurement that they should uh, concentrate on, or or what would what would your advice be? Uh, just ask this question to uh, Doctor Melissa, Doctor Hatim, and Sunil. Over to you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hello. hear. Hello, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh what I did when when I when all of this was starting, uh, this focus was starting. Uh, initially, uh, bef uh, initially it was all. Uh, full study echocardiogram, especially here in the Philippines, we're in the echocardiogram, uh, is being done by level three echocardiographers. No, when the focus uh wave or trend was starting, is that uh we just use whatever we have. Uh, it's quite a challenge whenever uh I do focus in a hospital wherein there is no. Uh, no uh, equipment other than the curvilinear probe, something like that. So I use what, what I can. And then I just interpret depending on how it responds, how, how the patients would respond. Uh, if, uh, for example, dealing with fluid responsiveness, if the heart would enlarge and if I would uh, appreciate a better contractility by eyeballing, 
then uh, when when the patient is on Trendelenburg position, then that simply to me is fluid responsiveness. And if the patient doesn't seem to uh, respond and the uh, contractility is bad, then I give the proper inotropic support. And then that's that's just it. Because uh, remember that the surgery is, uh, how, how long would a uh, lap laparoscopic cholecystectomy be? Diba? How long would a uh, orthopedic surgery be uh, for us to even do a, a longer study? and intervene uh, appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hatim, do you have any? Uh... Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Suresh. It's uh, quite an important question. Uh, uh, my thought on this is, um, I think the, I find the best and safest way to practice uh, ultrasound assessment is to be skeptical about every single parameter. Uh, I find it a big mistake to think that any of these parameters is perfect. I am a big advocate for a point of care ultrasound. And at the same time, I'm very skeptical of every single parameter, trying to understand the limitations. And when I practice and apply every parameter, I make sure that I don't fall into the trap of, of uh, blindly following any of them in isolation. So how I do systemic or how I do preload assessment is clinical assessment is the key. It's the foundation of our assessment, clinical context. Patient in general intensive care unit is very different from a patient in a complex cardiothoracic intensive care unit. Trauma patient is different from a patient who had a long bypass in cardiac uh, theater. And at the same time, ultrasound integrates to clinical assessment, uh, and especially for uh, preload assessment and preload responsiveness. We know that there are many data on IVC collapsibility, distensibility of the SVC, VTI variability. I personally prefer the VTI variability uh, uh, and I use the passive grace uh, integrated with clinical assessment and make sure that I put this in the context of RV function because we know that patients with RV failure will have unreliable assessment of VTI variability. Uh, so there is no single perfect answer. Uh, the best way is to combine all the parameters together, as I mentioned in my talk, pieces of jigsaw puzzle, hoping that you have a clearer picture of your patient. Thank you, Dr. Hatim. Uh, that was very, very informative. And what about from Sunil? Have you got uh, Dr. Sunil? Um, thank, thanks, Dr. Suresh. Um, very similar to actually uh, everybody else, um, put it all together. It has to be clinical responses. I would add that my question really is, firstly, you need shock to give somebody fluid. You have to have an indication to give it uh, or to suspect hypovolemia. Secondly, you have to ask yourself, is it safe to give fluid? So are the lungs dry or wet? Are the veins distended or not? And is the heart failing or not? And if it's safe to give it, then you should objectively try some kind of preload assessment test. Now there's tests of pretest probability with like a passive leg race where you don't give any fluid, but you just try try the maneuver and see if it works. And of course, respiratory variations if the caveats are met um, or post-test probability, you know, if, if it's safe to just give fluid, give it, give an appropriate amount. One of the caveats with a lot of the studies is uh, they artificially in the context of a clinical trial define preload responsiveness as a 10 or 15% increase in stroke volume or cardiac index uh, with a certain mils per kilo of fluid. Now, uh, just be careful with that because in different clinical contexts, the volume of your fluid challenge will vary uh, broadly. If your veins are completely flat and the patient is shocked, you can be more liberal with your fluid challenge. And if your veins are intermediate in size, um, then you should be a little bit more cautious with your fluid challenge. I think that's, that's, that's the secret to it all. But you have to have an objective clinical response, not just hemodynamics or transient responses. You have to see an, an improvement in your vasopressor or inotropic requirement. You have to see an improvement in your lactate. Uh, and you need to know when to stop giving fluids as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, I'll pass, pass it over to Dr. Koh to continue. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. 
Okay, um, there, there is a question in our Q&A list about um, the use of pokers contributing to improve pain and outcomes in the perioperative and critical care settings. So perhaps I can call on uh, Prof Chia, Prof Kano. In your years of experience, um, do you see the increased adoption of pokers um, uh, actually contributing to improved patient outcomes? Prof Chia? Oh, hi, Prof Kano. Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, in my country, actually, point of care is still very new. I was actually um, enticed by Dr. Fatil to study POCUS way back. I think that was in 2015. So during that time, there was no point of care ultrasound yet in my country. But now it is gaining momentum. So... All of the anesthesiologists here now are trying to study point of care because they saw the advantages in terms of management, not only intraoperatively, but also preoperatively and postoperatively. So in our patients now, in my university, we are now using point of care. More or less, the residents can now eyeball an ejection fraction and more or less, they're also learning the basics, at least in determining some um, some abnormalities in cardiac and lung ultrasound. So we are slowly getting there. So at least now they can see what are the advantages and we are enticing and we are attracting more anesthesiologists to study it more. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Kano. Um, Prof. Chia? Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm a cardiologist and intensivist, and I think that the use of pokers has been rising around, not just in the cardiac ICU, but in all the ICUs uh, in my hospital. It does help us to make decisions in terms of identifying the reasons for shock. So for example, it's hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, because the patients go all oh, well have the same mean arterial pressure. So a very simple focus assessment allows us to make good decisions. And I like the part on using ultrasound to guide our choice of preload responsiveness assessment before the free administration. I think it's been very well emphasized by our earlier speakers that the reason for giving a free bolus is really to try to improve the stroke volume and therefore the perfusion of the tissues. And if the freight bolus doesn't work in this aspect, it's just going to increase the days of mechanical ventilation, increase the length of stay in ICU, and even higher mortality. So it is very important to assess freight responsiveness before free administration, and also based on what we learned today about freight tolerance. So I think that now there's a lot of understanding. In the past 10 years, I believe that when a patient is in shock in the ICU, it's very common to give a freight bolus immediately and a hope that the blood pressure gets higher. I think nowadays we are a bit more careful, like what I mentioned early on by the speaker, fruits should really be considered as a medication. And if it doesn't help us to improve perfusion, it may cause more congestion and cause more harm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Chen and Prof Kano. Prof Desh? Uh, I just have a, a, a question uh, about point of care ultrasound education. Uh, what do people, I mean, uh, what it's more about point of care ultrasound in undergraduate education. Uh, I would like to kind of find out uh, what the practices are in, in all of the different countries, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, uh, and Singapore. Uh, are we teaching medical students uh, POCUS at present? And is there a need to teach medical students POCUS? Uh, could you share your experience with us, please? And also from the UK as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hatim, you have, uh, you have raised your hand. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. I actually have a brief comment on the last question because it's an important, very important one before I talk about education. We are in an outcome-driven um, uh, era of medicine. Um, we know that getting outcome data in critical care is difficult. The running a randomized control trial is really challenging. But I tend to think of ultrasound differently, as we all know that. Uh, do we have outcome data on stethoscope that it improves outcome in, in medicine? So uh, uh, one of the things that I, I tend to th think and 
uh, an advocate for is truly thinking of ultrasound as an assessment. It's not diagnostic. So when we teach people, we should tell them clearly that this is not diagnostic level assessment. And that makes the clear distinction between assessment, enhanced bedside physical examination. And we're, just to give you a brief example, we trained uh, our critical care physiotherapy team here on lung ultrasound. They are physiotherapists. They use lung ultrasound instead of the stethoscope. And we ran a project, collected data, and they found that 60% of patients, the management changed with lung ultrasound compared to X-ray. And 30% of patients, the management did not change, but at least even in those 30% of patients whom you confirmed the X-ray findings, you proved that you can replace X-ray with lung ultrasound. So I just hope um, uh, I'm able to clearly convey to you my message. Assessment makes it diff uh, different to our learners from diagnosis, and therefore we are not uh, necessarily preaching and advocating for a clear outcome-based data, which might happen in the future and might not. Um, and then the education question, Dr. Suresh. Uh, I think we are, even in the UK, we're behind uh, the United States, for example, in uh, in undergraduate uh, POCUS education. Uh, the, almost 50% of school uh, medical schools in the States have integrated POCUS in their curriculum, and we are still uh, starting this in the UK. And in my uh, affiliated university in King's College, we started two years ago undergraduate point of care ultrasound for the IBSC students. And hopefully from next year, it will be part of the undergraduate curriculum, but it's still a work in progress. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatim. Uh, would someone else from Malaysia like to comment on undergraduate focus? Dr. Hasmizi or Dr. Sharidan? I'm uh hi I'm not in UST. I think uh, I I let the uh, professor uh, from UCAM to answer. Hi, salam and uh, I'm Azarina. Um, I work in University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Uh, as for education for undergraduate, I think um we are almost similar to what Dr. Hatim was commenting. Uh, is still uh, far behind. Uh, we only in the uh, process because of the level of the knowledge is that actually it's just right um, level one and two minimum specific education and know and explaining about the importance of our focus uh, but for that is more for our undergraduates but in our postgraduate yes it's heavily involved uh, especially with our national curriculum uh, it has been integrated in our perioperative care uh, syllabus and uh, it's been uh, as, uh, teach um, bed, bed sites and also uh, there is some kind of training that log books they have to uh, make sure they are fulfilled prior to um, their exit exam. And uh, this is also very important for them to be registered as anesthesiologists later. And um, similarly, not only for the perioperative care, it also uh, been stressed uh, the importance of uh, focus for monitoring, uh, diagnostic and also therapeutic in the ICU care that has been uh, heavily uh, discussed in our uh, webinar uh, tonight. Yeah. That's uh, the take from Malaysia. Now, very much less on the basic. Okay. So, for the Philippines, it's not yet included in our undergraduate courses, the point of care ultrasound, more so for residency training. It's just starting. We already set up the point of care special interest group. I was the one who actually initiated it so that we can start to try to emphasize among our residents and our colleagues who are already practicing anesthesiology that this is very much needed in our practice. It is but mandatory to learn point of care ultrasound and it should be included in our armamentarium as an anesthesiologist. So we are still in that level one, but we hope to continually progress as we 
as we try to educate our colleagues, we now have a series of point of care ultrasound webinars in our country. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yui from on. Singapore. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I'm an anesthetist and an intensivist um, for Singapore. Uh, medical schools are emerging in this uh, field and um, currently it is mainly as an adjunct for education of anatomy. So ECHO is being used to an illustrate anatomy and uh, FAST is being introduced as well in emergency medicine. But it's um, becoming more and more emphasized in postgraduate education. Um, again, it is still in infancy where we are focusing more on image uh, interpretation. But I think it's uh, gaining momentum and it will soon be in intensive care training. And we are uh, working on having more um, collaborations and education. I think the I think the problem is having, um, there are several courses, but I think we need to establish some structure and program for supervision so that image acquisition also becomes something that we look at and not just um, in image interpretation. Over. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are probably running quite late. Uh, it's already it's about three minutes to to uh, ten twenty. Uh, Doctor Zening, do you have any last question to ask? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank okay. You. Does anyone from the panel like to say any last words before I hand over to Doctor Hazmizi? Okay. Well, now thank you very much to all to all our participants. It was a really great turnout. We had about two thousand four hundred uh, participants, two thousand seven hundred participants, and once again, thank you to GE Healthcare and all our speakers, Doctor Hatim, uh, Doctor Sunil, Doctor um, uh, Doctor Melissa, and uh, Doctor Sheridan. Uh, I'll just hand you over to Doctor Hazmizi, who is the president elect for the Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists and uh, he will just give a closing some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of um, uh, actually, I think uh, I, 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 I'd like to say thank you very much to uh, many peoples. Uh, first, uh, for you, Dr. Suresh, for initiate this uh, uh, this uh, collaboration, this uh, webinar. You first uh, contacted us. Uh, that was uh, last year, and then. Um, uh, second speakers, uh, Dr. Sharidan from Malaysia, Dr. Melissa Maria Colanto from Philippine Heart Center, Dr. Hatim from Royal Brompton, and Dr. Sunel from uh, Singapore General Hospital, and uh, and also the society, the Singapore Society of Anesthesiology, the Society of Intensive Care Medicine of Singapore, the Malaysia Society of Anesthesiology and College of uh, Anesthesiology, and Academy of Medicine of Malaysia, the Philippine Society of Anesthesiology, and mostly the most important. Um, is a GE healthcare because they provide us the platform and then they uh, always uh, keep updating us uh, what we need to do. I hope this is uh, not the first one. Uh, we uh, we are surprised. Uh, I mean, I'm also surprised. We can, we can see that's a lot of our participants, especially from Singapore, uh, from Indonesia. There's a lot of questions which uh, we cannot answer. But I think probably uh, the next time uh, we should include the, our colleagues from Indonesia. I'm sure there is uh, more things to need to discuss. I think that's a good effort. Probably uh, later on we can think about probably a chapter of uh, focus in uh, I mean in for South Asia. I think that that, that, uh, that is a this is a good start. Okay, uh, nothing much. Uh, now it's uh, almost uh, ten twenty in Malaysia. Same in Singapore. It's very quite late. Uh, I I am sure everyone tired. I'm also tired. Uh, today. Uh, I hope we see you again. Uh, in the future. Good night from Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good, night. Good, night. Good night. Good night from the Philippines. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.